But this evening, we're very happy to have with us Dr. Harold Reitman and Asper Tools. If you ask Dr. Harold Reitman, labels are a lousy way to describe a unique human being. Whether it's Asperger's, high-functioning autism, ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette's, or even the so-called neurotypical brain itself, one size does not fit all. Everyone's brain is different. Helping others get it when it comes to dealing with those so-called learning disabilities is why Reitman has written this book. After reviewing the scientific community's research conducted over the last 40 years, Dr. Reitman believes that it's time to not just accept neurodiversity, but to embrace it, and this book will help do just that. Dr. Harold Reitman is an orthopedic surgeon, a former professional and Golden Gloves champion heavyweight boxer, philanthropist, and movie producer. His recent release, The Square Root of Two, is a fictionalized adaptation of his daughter Rebecca's challenges at college. But here to give him a more formal introduction, I'd like to welcome the chair of the Constituency Board of CARD. Please welcome Ms. Nancy Zaretsky. We are very pleased to partner with Books and Books tonight. Um, we find ourselves here in a triangulation between uh, Dr. Reitman, Hakey, Books and Books, and CARD. We're all here to bring awareness to autism, to create community, and to create um, the acceptance of diversity. Because through diversity, we find our strengths. Um, so I'm very thankful to Books and Books. They have been um, really wonderful partners to us, always suggesting ways that they can help reach the community in wider uh, ways, aspects whether it's through authors, events. Um, so um, I'm thankful to Books and Books and very thankful to be here with someone who's like-minded. Um, we also are joined here tonight by our clinical director, Dr. Jennifer Stella DeRocha. She will say hello and give you a few words on autism for just a moment. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out here. Again, we are extremely pleased to be partnering with Books and Books. Um, for this wonderful event. We feel very strongly at CARD, uh, the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities, that people with autism deserve a full membership in society to be fully included, and that in Autism Awareness Month, it's the best time to celebrate neurodiversity. And so the theme of this book really speaks to us. For those of you who don't know about us, we are one of seven state-funded centers um, for autism in the state of Florida. And we are tasked with um, helping optimize the potential of people with autism by engaging in direct um, support services to families and the community. So with autism now at one in 68, we feel that the time is right to step up our services and our community partnerships to really bring the community along in a way that serves our individuals the best. And so again, we're extremely pleased to be part of this event. And without any further ado, please help us in welcoming tonight's author. Thank you very much. Everybody for being here. I want to make it first very clear that I'm just a clueless father who's a little bit less clueless now. And what I did was I just wrote down all the stuff that I learned and I'm finding more and more by collaborating with the real experts like you just heard from the Center for Autism Related Disability and other people how much we need this that one size does not fit all. All our brains are different. I got expelled twice, once in the first grade, once in the tenth grade, but I was still able to get where I was going. And I want to say that I'm so happy with such great people in the audience such as Kitty Dumas from the Miami Herald, my friend Don Steigman, the Chief Operating Officer over at Jackson Medical, which does so much for so many. Dr. Eddie Dower, a great philanthropist who does a tremendous amount at the university everywhere else. Uh, Neil Capone and so many others. Um, Steve Foreman, author and philanthropist. And I could go around the room. There are many people here, and I apologize for leaving out my girlfriend, the wonderful Dr. Gretchen Heinzen, who does a lot for the Junior Welfare League. Um, so uh, with the Asper tools, which I named because I just wanted to give simple tools we could all use because I went to school. So what I'm going to do is um, try to tell the story or show it to you through some video. Um, some of it starring Darby Stanfield, and many of you may know her on Scandal. She's the star of my not yet released movie, The Square Root of Two, which I made 
because of some problems my daughter had at Georgia Tech, which was a wonderful place. I made a fictionalized version, but it, I didn't know until after I made the movie what the movie was really about. His name is Hacky Reitman, Dr. Harold Reitman. Dr. Harold Reitman, a heavyweight boxer, Hacky Reitman, better known to his patients as Dr. Harold Reitman, orthopedic surgeon. Dr. Reitman got interested in boxing as a kid back in Jersey City. He boxed in medical school where he won a Golden Gloves championship, then got back into boxing just a few years ago when his daughter had to have a serious operation. And at the time, I just uh, kind of said, if you just let Rebecca do all right, and I'll find the biggest, toughest guy in Florida, and I'll fight him. This is not a fairy tale. Hacky lost a split decision. But out of defeat came a wonderful idea. Keep fighting and donate the money to kids' charities. There's a lot of good things that everybody can do for kids. And it's just it's just there to do it. And it, I'm not talking about poor kids or rich kids or just kids who need operations or anything. Just kids. Hacky won his last fight, and so did the Abused Children's Fund. They got the $15,000 purse. Next month, Hacky will enter the ring again. And win or lose, another children's charity will gain. And then there will be another fight. Although with Hacky, it's not fair to call them fights. Call them expressions of love for children because of one very special little child. You got a big hug and a kiss before I go? Give me a kiss. So then, what, the, what Asper Tools is, I'm going to get to the derivation of it, but it was really then with Rebecca we found had some issues when she was growing up. She was a, just a little bit different. She had a seizure and we found out that a radiologist such as Dr. Dower said, you know, I've never seen one of these. She's got 23 brain tumors. She required two major brain surgeries. You'd never know what to talk to her. And she, uh, she was going about her business. And uh, we had her tested, and she had some ADHD, some memory deficits. And after the surgery, and all of the parents in this room know that, that feeling in the pit of your stomach where you just pray to God and say, you know what, I'll do anything. Just let my kid do OK. And the way I chose to deal with it as she grew up and was all counting in track and was doing well in school, and going through all the stuff adolescents and teens go through, except she was having some trouble socializing. She had these parents who were just overbearing, overprotective. Don't let her do sleepovers. Don't let her do this or that. She's got the seizure disorder. She's got this other stuff. And, you know, she's a little bit socially awkward, but then it all, she wanted to go get her discrete mathematics degree because all she wanted to do was math, and she wanted to tutor kids, which she did since middle school, with disabilities. And I didn't know why, but she knew why. And then when she encountered some problems and challenges at school, and against my wishes, as many of these kids, who by the way turn into adults, will do against the parents' wishes, she emerged victorious. She took on the whole system there. Endangered a graduation, had me fighting against her. But after it was all done, I went to the uh, I went to the director of housing and said, "What are you?" He says, "What are you here for? You refund?" I said, "Well, yeah." He goes, "What are you really here for?" I said, "Well, I'm I'm shook up because you people are all so nice. You're dedicated educational professionals. You knew the story. You knew the right thing to do." And he finished the say. He said, "Yeah, but our hands were tied by an irrational set of laws." that govern our universities today. And then he said, somebody ought to make a movie. But I didn't right then. Then I did. I decided I'm going to make this movie. And I made The Square Root of Two. And Darby Stanchfield from Scandal decided to study my daughter di directly instead of listening to the writer-producer director. And after the movie was made, Rebecca went to two the kids at Cumberland Academy of Georgia for Asperger's and autism, and the owner of the school met Rebecca for 10 minutes and said, looked at me, said, hey, you know, your daughter had Asperger's, and I said, what's that? What are you talking about? Oh, it's on the autism spectrum. What the hell are you talking about, okay? Well, thus began my journey. I started learning, I started researching, I held off on releasing the movie. And during the movie, 
Darby Stansfield, who's wonderful, she's just a wonderful actress, she connected with Rebecca and she just listened to Rebecca. She didn't listen to me. So, like Rebecca was explaining how when the argument is over, puts the hand up, done. You're not going to talk to her, okay? She was explaining things to Darby that me, as the all knowing idiot parent, had no clue and didn't want to listen to the kid because I knew what to do. And the father in the movie totally depicts a clueless dad who's not listening to his kid, unbeknownst to me at the time of making the movie. So as I started writing this book, I got two great authorities. I got Patty Fasano, the world's greatest ESE Asperger's teacher in Boca Raton. Wonderful, she gets it. And I got my personal favorite, my daughter Rebecca with her discrete mathematics degree. Now go, it couldn't be here today because dad, why don't you read the book? I have class tonight at Lynn University. She's going for a master's in applied psychology. Don't overwhelm me. Why don't you read the book? Okay. <laughs> and she taught me what's at the top of the book that HCI books and Kim Weiss and everybody put on there. That brains are like snowflakes, no two are alike. That's what I didn't get. And that's what society has to get. They have to get that it's okay to be different. If I have a deaf student, what am I gonna holler at them the way I'm hollering at you right now, okay? If I have a blind student, why am I gonna write on a blackboard? Doesn't make any sense. And that's what we do. We do it in the workplace, we do it everywhere. But I'll tell you what, I want to appeal to the greed and the profitability of corporations to get smart like Apple and Google because they embrace it. They embrace this totally. You want to be different? That's okay. We'll give you everything you need. So I'm writing 4,000 pages. I got this huge document I don't know what to do with. And I go to my Apple one-to-one -one where I have this 40-year-old guy. I just got an email from him today, by the way, who says, uh, well, you have 4,000 pages. I suggest you use such and such software. And he reads the document and he starts smiling and say, what are you smiling about? I say to this 45-year-old guy. He goes, well, I have Asperger's. I said, tell me a little bit. He goes, I was lost till I was 40. Flunked out of high school, did drugs, got in trouble with the law. On top of it, I'm gay. He goes, I, I was lost. I said, well, what happened at age 40? He said, I came to Apple. What happened at Apple? He said, they didn't care that I could only take an exam with headphones on listening to Gregorian chant music. He says, by the way, Doc, that Spotify is terrific. 10 bucks a month, I get all the Gregorian chant music. He goes, they didn't care. I can only read books if four of them are open at a time. They didn't care. All they cared about was if I was going to do a good job. And I've since gotten two master's degree, and I'm doing charity work at the Pavarello Center. I'm traveling to Russia to help the elderly there. I said, boy, that's pretty, pretty good. You know, pretty good. He goes, you better write this book, okay? And so I did. Treating all brains alike in a classroom setting, especially, that's um, is wrong. You have to treat each and every one differently. Let me tell you, you start looking at the statistics of one in 68 births being on the autism spectrum now. And you look, if you start adding up people with anxiety, PTSD, depression, bipolar, OCD, ADHD. I'll keep naming initials. There are a bunch of different people that make up our population. And everybody I talk to has got a friend or a cousin or a family member whose brain is different. I don't care what the label is. And personally, I think labels are a lousy way to describe a unique human being. We can't put them in boxes. We have to allow each child the opportunity to be successful. And so if the child takes a little longer to learn that three times three is nine, that's okay. Asper Tools has a, a very important premise in that all brains are not alike. I suggested to Hackey that what he was writing for was really a commentary on communication, whether it be parent-child communication or relationships communication, that it's not just for people with Asperger's because all of our brains are different. 
I think a great thing that's being done by utilizing the term Asper tools and realizing that there's this broad spectrum of how people present, then you can fine tune the therapy to the person who's having the problem instead of saying one one therapy helps all people with Asperger's. The conventional medical community is at a loss to give us good answers, any good answers, about autism or Asperger's syndrome or any of these developmental problems that we're seeing in this century. I believe that Asper tools, uh, that the square root of two and Dr. Hackey Reichman are at the vanguard of changing people's perceptions about what's going on. And uh, because we have a federal judge here today, Jimmy Kahn, I'm going to deputize all of you to start spreading the word, the Asper Tools word, that it's not one size fits all, that different is okay. Okay, it's, it's all right. We just have to give people the tools they need, give them the help they need so they can be productive, happy, healthy. And I think that adults along the way have been discriminated against because we all love the little kids. And Rebecca's 32 years old now, okay? And she's teaching and tutoring in an after-school program. She's going for an advanced degree. She chose to live at a place where she gets her own apartment, but she gets some extra coaching. She takes transportation for the disabled because she doesn't drive, okay? And so I'm going to tell you a few things you should know about people with Asperger's syndrome. But remember, I'm calling Aspies anybody who's different. So. While I wrote this book to do with Asperger's Autism Spectrum, I threw in that word neurodiversity. And I'm already collaborating with experts on an Asper Tools for college transition, Asper Tools for depression, Asper Tools for addiction, because it's all the same stuff. It's all the, the similar tools we can all use. And if you read Asper Tools, which is just stories with some simple tools, it's not there's no great scientific treatise. Eddie Dow knows I'm not smart enough for that. I was just an orthopedic surgeon. But let's first go through some things you should know about people with Asperger's syndrome. First of all, the senses are all hyper. I didn't know this. So I would scream at Rebecca and her ears and her, her hearing, temperature, sight, smell, touch. It's all too much for them. It occupies the whole brain. I didn't know they took everything literally. If you say it's raining cats and dogs, the brightest Aspie in the world, look out the window, see if it's doing that. If you say I'm picking you up at 10 o'clock, you better be there at 10 o'clock. I pick up Rebecca at 10, 16, because it's a square number, and I better be there on time. They have a hypersensitivity to certain senses. Maybe it's touch, maybe it's temperature, maybe it's feel, maybe it's food. We have to be more sensitive to the fact that every sense that we have is much more acute in those patients. They'll just focus on their sensitivity. They're going to focus on their smells or the sounds. Trying to communicate with that person about anything else is a lost cause because they're focused on remedying that sensitive area. Everything is black and white with them. They take things specifically. They actually believe what you're telling them. They actually believe it. If you tell them something, they expect you to do it. So what does this idiot father do in the movie? It's complicated. No, it's black and white. I know I'm gonna make it. Rachel, to you, everything is black and white. But in real life, there are gray areas. In real life, it's not like math. Things change. Well, everything should be like math. I think the number one thing with, with someone who has Asperger's is the black and white thinking. And I think the black and white thinking is kind of the cause of a lot of the other issues and also the cause of the anxiety. You know, all or nothing, um, there's no gray area. So when I say I'm going to be there at 3, um, it could be 3.05, but for somebody with Asperger's, that 3 o'clock means 3 o'clock. And if you show up late, that's difficult and anxiety producing for somebody with Asperger's. Literal thinking. You got to teach them, you got to train them these idioms, what they mean. They don't know. They just don't know. A lot, once you realize that a lot of things instinctive to us, they don't know. You teach it to them, then they know it. 
They don't know if you get in an elevator sometimes, you're supposed to face the front, not the back. They don't have instincts. So this literal thinking. Now, William, who you're going to see, is starring May 1st and 2nd, I think, at the Broward Center for the Performing Arts in West Side Story. He's an honor student at uh, Great High School. My first time I took the driver's license test, right? They said parking this parking spot, and it was um, basically four cones. So they said park in between the four cones. I parked in between the four cones, like I was told to do. But the problem was that I parked in sideways, so like all the parking lines go like this, and instead of parking in, like pulling in, like you would pull into a parking spot, instead I pulled in like horizontally across all the parking lines. She said she had never in her life, over 20 years working at the DMV, experienced someone parking diagonally in the parking spot that was so clearly meant for someone to park a certain way, and I didn't. And so I ended up failing my driver's license test, but I learned a valuable lesson. And we have to embrace neurodiversity. And it's what I've been finding in this is I'm getting more people with different brains to come out of the closet. The same way gay people had to come out of the closet. 25 years ago when I was having my 10 seconds of fame because I knocked out a few people and took a lot of good beatings myself. Neil saw me get some beatings. Um, I got to meet with the President of the United States to discuss children's problems. You know, and you, you had access with that. But you have to understand that we're in a time now when everybody's different. When I got my 10 seconds of fame then, the reason I didn't get the actual front page was because back then Oprah had a secret diet all the time. <laughs> all right? Now, when... Uh, uh, the wonderful journalist for the Miami Herald, uh, Kitty Dumas, who does so much for people who need some help. Um, she was going to be on the front page with the article that she wrote about Aspertools, and the same thing came on there as when I did a radio show Saturday for Atlanta and another one for CBS Radio, but the, the lead-in now is Bruce Jenner because... It's just another diversity. Let him be whatever he wants. Just do good, do good things, be nice. So in the same way our population, if you start adding up all of the different ethnic groups, the majority white Caucasians are in the minority. In the same way, if you want to talk about neurotypicals, I'll tell you, you start adding up the one in 68 autistic, the one in five Americans on anxiety medications, depression, bipolar, OCD, PTSD, very rampant. And I could keep naming initials all day. That's not important. What's important is get over it and get with it and let's give everybody tools they need because society needs them. Let me tell you something. We were at the uh, 48th annual uh, Boys and Girls Club of Broward County dinner auction an organization where we serve 13,000 kids. We're very proud of the Hackey Reitman unit that we have a 90% high school graduation rate and that at the Concourse to Elegance where Eddie Dower has chaired and helped raise millions of dollars for these kids, that the kids just need a, a shot. They need a chance. We all need a chance. And the kids turn into adults. Now Aspies will tell you the truth. They could throw you out of school, or even jail. But I know I'm right, and you know I'm right, and everyone knows I'm right. It's clear to her, there's right and there's wrong, and I am gonna fight for what's right, and it's quite refreshing, actually. A Asperger's patients seem to see things in, in a lot of black and white states, and so there's truth and there's not the truth. But how they perceive it may be something different. So if they're perceiving something that they think is a truth and tell you, but it really wasn't, it's not a lie, it's just the way they perceive it. What's not refreshing is when you get out and out rudeness. And this is where behavior modification has to come in because you're not gonna get away with rudeness for the sake of being rude out in the real world. I beg your pardon. Yes, I think you should. <laughs> The first chapter in the book is anxiety. We all have anxiety. 
I had tremendous anxiety coming here today. You know, uh, oh, it's a presentation. I, I drove poor Steve and Paul crazy with, is the PowerPoint going to be ready? Oh my God, what's going to be? Uh, David Lindsley, our producer, who does so much, and Matt, I'm driving everybody, everybody nuts. But when anxiety becomes too great, then you get a meltdown. So the idea is to prevent the meltdown. So you got to observe. Marie over here, she's calling the police and housing. I've asked Asperger's patients if they know that they're going to have a meltdown. The older people have definitely said they can feel it coming on. They'll write about it, and it's just like an itch that starts to, to, to burn in them, and it builds and it builds. It's like being cornered, and they're trying to get out of this corner. They're doing everything possible to get out of this corner. Basically, it's like a communication block, and I just reflect everything and don't really take anything in. And someone, and usually what my, what my meltdowns, when they happen, people around me actually have real meltdowns because they can't get through to me. So then they start getting really, really emotional, and that just makes it worse. And the way Asper Tools is written, you have the clueless dad who now thinks he knows a lot of stuff, writes part. Then you have the box by the greatest teacher. And teachers, by the way, need a lot of, the poor teachers, they don't get any training in this. And then you have a box by the Aspie herself where she sets it straight. And so Rebecca writes things like, well, I know my dad thinks that, but just let it take the wave and get out of the way. You know, so we get all the aspects of it. So here are some tools, and our time is running short because I already went over the time I'm supposed to talk so we can answer questions and sign some books. And I apologize, I talk too much. So I'm just going to run through some of these tools, but in the book, in the Aspen Tools book, you'll see some real tools you can use. Again, there's no magic bullets, it's not anything esoteric. It's just, uh, you know, let's see what we can do. First thing is observation. I was a big Sherlock Holmes fan, you know, and uh, his right-hand man, you know, Dr. Watson said, oh, you're so smart. He goes, I'm not so smart. Oh, you're smart. He goes, hey, Watson, how long have we been living on Baker Street? Oh, about 14 years. How many steps are there? He goes, I don't know. He goes, well, there's 17. You know why I know? I counted them. So count it with your kid. Count it with your spouse. Count it when you try to tune in on the brain when you're negotiating a deal. Everybody's brain is different. They, you got to observe. How about asking your kid, what are you interested in? <laughs> There's a novel idea. Maybe they'll tell you. Always let them know they have egress to a safe place. It's very, very important. Because if you know, I can't get to a safe place, they're going to get a lot of anxiety. Rebecca, let's go to the football game. You'll love that. The noise, the things, the everything else. How's she going to get out of there if she needs to? You take to a big family function, once she's had enough and she's overwhelmed, she doesn't drive. How's she going to get out of there? Now, routines are the big double-edged sword because they don't want to change their routines. I don't like to change my routine. All right? Gretchen has to go nuts every time we have to travel because I have a meltdown going through security at the you know, airport. And everything. I got to get there three hours early because otherwise I'm going to get nervous. All right? so, if you're going to change a routine, make sure there's a good reason for it, okay? Because everybody's brain is different. That's why it's so exciting to me to be able to be, you know, to be able to collaborate with real experts. Like I'm, I'm hoping um, someday to do it. Somebody else who wrote a great book that's called I'm 50, So What? But it's in Spanish, the Univision movie star, Gretchen's great friend, Giselle Blondet, who's here. Giselle, thanks for being here. And she talks about what it is to hit 50 when you're a beautiful woman movie star. When I went to see her on uh, doing a big show on Univision with thousands of people there, when there was a break and the camera went off, I had to go to the bathroom. So I got up, it was on Mother's Day, and I walked out, and as I'm walking out, she says over the microphone, Hacky, where are you going? I got a million people looking at me. I gotta go to the bathroom, you know? Routines, positive routines, positive structure, positive activities, okay, they're essential. And if you want to get an Aspie to do something, 
Don't give them an open-ended thing. Don't say, do you want to go out to eat? They'll go, no, I want to stay in my room on my computer. Say, hey, do you want to go over here to Chili's or do you want to go over here to Friday's? Then they feel empowered. Be specific. You're not doing them any favors when I call up Rebecca and say, hey, I'm going to pick you up to go to the doctor. Make sure you got everything. Wait, what are you talking about? If I say instead, I'm going to pick you up at 1016, you know you have the doctor's appointment, bring your medical ID, bring your insurance card, pack a lunch, we'll be back in two hours, and I'll see you then. Then it's easy. I've relieved everything. If instead, like Latin to Latin uh, public relations and marketing, which is nice enough to arrange things with a great place like Books and Books, Let's hear it for books and books for doing things like this. They, they start telling me, you want to do this, you want to do that. I say, look, just give them, send me an email and just be specific. I'll do whatever you say, but you've got to tell me exactly what to do. Chunking. You can't overwhelm people. Uh, we have a friend uh, who's uh, a handyman, does construction and stuff, and... Uh, his stepson is autistic, but a very good worker. And if he says, and he knows how to pick up tile with a jackhammer, loves doing it, is good at it. Now, if Charlie says to Christopher, pick up the floor, I'll be outside, come and get me when you're done. The, the, the kid who's like 30 years old walks around in circles, doesn't know what to do. It's crazy. If in, so it took Charlie two years to learn, pick up those six tiles, put them in a neat pile, and then come and get me. And he does it, comes out and gets them. Then he does 12. Then he does 18. Works 12 hours straight, loving it, happy. Does a better job than anybody. That's the kind of stuff we need to do. So you have to chunk things out so you're not overwhelmed. Rules, rewards, and consequences. You got to, like all of us, we're all like Pavlov's dogs. We're all in skin of boxes. And, uh, you know, you've, you've got to... Figure out the, the right way to make the rewards work and the punishment work. Contracts. There's a scene in the movie that people thought I made up, and we're, we're just winding up here. I'll just get through these last couple of slides. Um, and everyone thought I was making it up, but no. When Rebecca was going off to college, she would not get in the truck unless I signed the contract that I would not buy a condo within two miles of Georgia Tech that I couldn't visit more than once every two weeks, and that I had to call before I went. And, you know, she made me sign it, and she put little stipulations down there, too, you know. She wasn't fooling around. Um, great Asper tools are, and there are many more in the book, structure and positive activities, okay, uh, create relaxation techniques, Develop a social script role-playing. And, of course, social awkwardness is a big problem, but there are ways Patty Fasano has taught to do it, and you have to engage in role-playing. The biggest Asper tool of all is unconditional love. Let me tell you something. We all have anxiety. We all need to be loved, all right? But they need it more because they feel like they're on trial with you that they somehow have let you down tremendously. They let you down. It's a horrible feeling. And encouragement and a pat on the back goes a long way. And just recognition. A lot of this is just listen to the other person, no matter who it is, <laughs> but especially if it's your kid or your significant other with Asperger's or your cousin or your aunt. Or, it's epidemic. But it's not just Asperger's, it's everybody who's different. So I think that, you know, recognizing that your child is different from other people, but not worse, only different, um, can make them feel a lot better and do a lot better for the child. And for the child, recognizing that they don't have to feel like they're less than other people because they see things differently. A lot of the issues can be overcome and mitigated in ways that they are almost unnoticeable. Knowing that that can happen, that you can overcome those challenges, it motivates you to actually work on them. If I know that something is possible, then I'm going to put the effort towards 
working on it and overcoming that challenge. And by doing so, all I'm going to be doing is improving myself. And if the parents can just follow it through, or the, or the bosses, or the teachers, if they can just follow it through, it would be amazing what they would get from that child, from the adult. They're, you know, everybody's brain is different, every single person. And if we can just get people in general just to understand that, life would be easier. This is not a sentence. This is a journey. And I can tell you now that my relationship with my daughter has just gotten a lot better. She's really doing a lot of good for a lot of people. She's being very productive and everything. And uh, I hope that all of you get in touch with me through our, our website, aspiratools.com, and tell me about the, your person that you care about who might be a little bit different. We're making a series of Aspiratools documentaries, a series of Aspiratool books, and I want to start a movement to just recognize this neurodiversity, embrace it, and do what we need to do. A couple of the people who came up earlier that I just had the pleasure of meeting are here because they want to know if they have Asperger's. They're well into adulthood, and they're like me. Their brains are a little bit different. Let me tell you something. Eddie Dower's brain is a little bit different. Don Steigman's brain is a little bit different. And Neil Capone's is. And if I have them all in a class, I can't teach them the same way. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Uh, Neil Capone, who's brilliant, will not mind me sharing that he has dyslexia. Our late great friend Bruce Rossmeyer of the Harley Davidson fame, the world's largest Harley Davidson dealer, he couldn't read. He didn't have a computer. He didn't have a pad. He could put together $10 million deals all day long. The examples go on and on, but it's tradespeople. It's people who can do things. I spoke with the best-selling author, John Elder Robeson, which was a trip. And luckily, I had read his book, Look Me in the Eye, ahead of time. And Rebecca had prepared me for talking to him. He's running a giant car restoration business in Massachusetts. He can fix and restore any car. Eddie Dow would take his cause to him. So this is Asper Tools. You are all now deputized to uh, help us spread the word. And please get in touch with me through our AsperTools.com website. If you like Asper Tools, please go to Amazon and write a review. Get on Facebook. Get on Twitter. Get on all those things that give me a headache, but the, a lot of the young people are, are better with it. And remember, that all it is is that one size does not fit all. Every brain is different, and being different is not a bad thing. It's just a different thing. Thank you all very much. All right, now I'm glad to answer any questions. If you promise to remember, I'm a clueless dad. Yes, Eddie. Hey. So how come I have heard that they don't want to use the word Asperger's anymore? They're getting away from that. Excellent question. I spoke to the head of the National Institute of Mental Health of the NIH, my classmate from Boston University, Dr. Tom Insel, who's much smarter than me and is getting himself into hot water because he, like me, knows that the wiring in our brains is different, and it's neuroplasticity. It actually changes. Your brains actually change physically, chemically, with how they connect. And he was against the DCS, SFD5, whatever you call that guide, getting rid of it. And the Asperger's community is up in arms. It's like this civil war. Oh, vitriolic. Um, Rebecca, for example, says, it's really dumb. We're, we're different. We're different. We're not autistic. I just think it doesn't matter myself because we're all on a spectrum. Not just the autism spectrum. We're on, all on a spectrum. Everybody can read Asper tools, and I guarantee you, you're going to identify with certain chapters. I like. I don't know what the heck you would call me, but I have issues. Okay, <laughs> I have issues. But that's the answer. But it's gone. Uh, it's gone officially, and if you're a doctor, you won't get paid unless you say autism spectrum. Next question. Yes. Uh, I've known many people in childhood who have been in bed for a long time because of diseases like genetic fever, polio, tuberculosis. Before this period of long time alone, they had 
what was not diagnosed then as ADD, uh, dyslexia, ADHD. Um, does a child being alone away from society help a little bit to cure these things? I think not. They find it much easier. It's much easier to be alone if you have social problems and anxiety. If you are uh, speaking before a large audience, if you get nervous with that, it's better if you just stay alone. And if you give them a choice, they will want to stay alone with their best friend, the computer, many times. I think that what has been shown throughout all of medical literature, and I can say this as an MD, that um, being around people being around caring pets, being around animals, is good for you. Your body makes something differently when you have people around who care, who love you, that you interact with. Alone is not good. Another thing that's great for all of these brain conditions is proper diet, nutrition, activity, and exercise. A good workout, if you're in a nursing home, will really hold off the dementia, which many think that I have, and I got hit in the head too many times and a lot of common sense stuff. And those are Asper tools that I'm working with nutritionists and with educational people. But there is no doubt, in my mind anyway, that alone is not a good place. That's just my opinion. Yes? Is there anything being done to study adults that weren't properly diagnosed as children and are trying to function in society nowadays? Because so many things are focused towards children. What about the adults that weren't properly diagnosed and where did Great point. Um, that's what I'm trying to change also. Why do we discriminate against adults? And what do we care when the diagnosis is made? Okay, Let's get everybody and take care of them. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I took Rebecca down to meet with the nice people at the Dan Marino Foundation. Okay, And they were just getting into, because a lot of their kids were now older and Dan's son was older. And so now they were thinking about teaching trades a lot of other stuff we do, by the way, at the Boys and Girls Club. We give them trade pathways and everything. I think personally, like my father was a mechanic. We had a gas station in Jersey City. I tell the kids at the Hackey Reitman Boys and Girls Club, you got to do get a high school diploma and then one step further, training-wise. Adults, their brains still change. They still have neuroplasticity. I told you the story of the 40-year-old guy at the Apple store. My daughter Rebecca is 32 and she is blossoming every day. She really is. Um, I've, I'm seeing it more and more. We have people in this room whose uh, sons just went off to college and they are just tremendous now. Uh, William, who you saw when he interned for me, uh, just went through a bit of a rough patch earlier and he is just cool, calm, collected, acting. And with that truth telling, you know, like he said, I have him in the documentary saying, well, Dr. Reitman, you see, when I get on the stage to act, I use those acting abilities. So when I walk in a crowded room, even if I don't like somebody, I can pretend I like them. <laughs> so I looked at him, and he's on film, and I said, William, you act as though you like me. <laughs> Silence. I don't know. Jury's out. I don't know how it is. Uh, but no, I think that adults can do and should do, and we have to treat everybody. It's not what, it's the elderly. I'm working on something for, for dementia. You know, just tools you can use. And I think it's a message of hope and positivity for all this stuff. Next question. Yes? I'm going to hold a card down here at yeah. the center for... Well, it isn't related uh, to this bill. I'm married and just realized my husband is after 29. They said that the state of Florida is so behind in helping autism and adults and we need to do something because as being married to and not being as the, I need help. Okay, number one, you're all deputized to write your congressman and everything about this stuff. It's true and Dateline did a great story the other day. Uh, last week on that. Look that up on Dateline, okay. on just that, the aging out. And the name of the clinic they were talking about was the Rebecca Clinic, coincidentally. Number two, there's a book, I heard this great couple being interviewed on NPR, if you're familiar, where the uh, husband is an Aspie and the wife is neurotypical, 
So the wife had to train the husband. So here's what the training consisted of, just to give an example. And I apologize, I forgot their names. But uh, she says, look, when I come home from work, I want you to make me a cup of tea, sit down with me at the kitchen table and ask me how my day was. <laughs> so he, she comes home, does it. How was your day? A good stuff. Tell him. She said after about a month, he actually started to care, you know. <laughs> but it's trained. Now that sounds funny, and I kind of meant it funny, but part of but it's not funny. They need to be trained in these things. Shake hands, look somebody in the eye. That's why they. That's why uh, John Elder Robeson called it uh, "Look Me in the Eye." It's so hard. I had an in intern who was autistic who came in. He's like 24 years old. And uh, he comes in with his father. And uh, of course, his father drove him. His father's doing everything for him. Father's talking for him. And I said, uh, hey, Gordon, you want to work here? And he's going, yeah. I go, good. You can't work here unless you shake hands with me and try to look me in the eye. And he looks at the father. And I said, otherwise, you can't work here. So he goes, comes up. And he shakes hands like this, and he looks at me. And I said, now, there's a trick. Another Aspie told me to look at your forehead, pretend to see eye, but I want you to shake firmer. Then I had to go around to David Lindsley and the other people in the office, and he was shaking hands. I got a call from his psychologist, was treating him for eight years, never calling him autistic. No, ADHD, gifted, whatever you want. I don't care about the label. How did you get him to do this? How did you do that? And it reminded me of Mel Brooks when he was like this, an AMD, almost the doctor. And he said, how did you get that woman to stop tearing paper? She'd been tearing it for 20 years. Nobody could do it. So I took her in the room. I says, hey, what do you want to tear paper for? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Yes. Hi. Anyway, I got the, I got the condition. I've been having it for over. Years. You got what? I'm sorry, I'm I here. got Asperger's. Okay. And when my father found out, and my mother, I don't know if you heard of Dr. Hamilton? He was the one who diagnosed that. Yeah. And I've been having psychiatrists, psychologists, like you said. Yeah. And they didn't know what's going on with me. That's um, I have a trouble in high school. My high school was a nightmare. I was like. Bullying? Yes. Bullying? Being misunderstood? Yes. Taking things Tell literally? Like yeah. You said, yeah. I heard a lot of people's feelings, yeah. looking in the eye. Yeah. Yes, I had all the problems. Well, yeah. let me tell you something. The Asper tools, okay, is for you too, because you, okay, you have to be deputized also, because have a seat. Now, just let me tell you this, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. My daughter is now, I'm writing this thing about college. Now, Rebecca is 32, wonderful is off at Lynn University. All Aspies hate group projects. Makes them all fail. Drives them crazy. Rebecca gets the first group project over there, and they want to murder her, OK? They, they just want it. And so Patty Fasano, who teaches with Rebecca and kind of mentors her, finally prevails by Rebecca. Let me call your group leader. So she finally does. And this nice woman who's a working mom going for her graduate degree in psychology. That's, what the, that's the level of ignorance we're talking about. I'm not singling them out. I'm saying teachers don't get trained. Doctors don't get trained. Nobody gets trained in this stuff. All right? And embrace it. It's fun. Our brains are different. Huh? So anyway, Rebecca might get mad at me for sharing this, but I will. <laughs> so. Um, Patty gets on the phone with this, uh, the secretary for the group and says, I don't want anything to do with her. She is so nasty and arrogant, you know. Well, tell me about it. Patty lets her dig a big hole. Big hole for her. Well, I said we're, we're getting together after class, which Rebecca didn't know if they were going to a bar, what they were going to do. Didn't know they were going to get together for the group. And I have to put all this together on Saturday so we can get it into the teacher Sunday. Well, all Rebecca knew, it was due on Sunday, before midnight Sunday, so she got it in at 11.45. But then it couldn't be done. And she went through everything that was classic Asperger's. So Patty listened to the whole thing, 
And she goes, well, isn't she arrogant with you? She goes, no. She goes, what do you mean? She's like a bitch. What are you talking about? She goes, well, you know about her disability, don't you? She doesn't have a disability. She's the smartest one in the class. She answers every question. Well, she asked, well, what's her disability? You ever hear of Asperger's? Kind of. Has something to do with autism or something? Yeah, here are the characteristics. With each characteristic, this poor woman goes, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Okay? Now, at the other end, at the Aspie end, over at your end, okay, is Rebecca, you, you have to tell the group I have Asperger's because they can't, they, you don't have a wheelchair, you don't have hearing aids like me, you, nobody sees your disability. You got to tell them. We got to have a dialogue about it. And they're going to say they have no idea what the hell it is. Okay? What I'm, my role is, is I'm not the real experts like these great psychologists. Uh, Gretchen and I were just out in Las Vegas. I spoke to the 13th Annual Adolescent Conference out there. Professional psychologists, therapists, teachers, very well received. I got invited to two, do two workshops at two universities. And I said, maybe you didn't see the presentation. I don't know anything. They go, no, this is what we need. Because it seems to me everybody's kind of preaching to the choir and nobody's getting it mainstreamed out to society. So yeah, I hope if the Aspertools message spreads, I'll get to talk to, you know, presidents and people like that and say, hey, let's straighten this out. We can do this. We can straighten this out. This is, this is something everybody wants. In the same way, we all want to embrace somewhere in our hearts all kinds of diversity. Okay? Do unto others as you have others do unto you. Be a nice person. Let everybody be happy, healthy, and productive. If I have a blind person and a deaf person, and I house them separately and keep them apart, they can't do very much. If I put them together, they can run a dry cleaning store. One's deaf, one's blind. Okay? Sorry to get off on a rant there. I got, got away from me a little bit. Uh, yes? Your remarks, I happen to be a parent of an adult, and I wanted to just speak to whoever asked about adults and let whoever in here wants to know that a, a research study did come out last week from Drexel University on adults, and there isn't a lot of research, but there's, in the last week and a half, there's been a lot of talk about what's going on with adults, and so I think that we have to just keep talking to people, and I started a social program um, three years ago um, for this for adults and you know what we have to just how do we make, find be loud that program um, Come on I'll, over here. I'll talk to you I'll talk to you about it after I have I and have if, if you would, with if you me. would all be kind enough to uh, email me through the Aspen Tools website I'll post it there and we'll get it we'll get it to everybody but that's great uh, thank you yes of the constituents at the card in the tri-county area, Broward, Dayton, Monroe, are 16 and older. We have over 8,800 families that we serve. We've grown by 10% every year for the past five years. If that were your business and you were selling tires, you'd be so happy. <laughs> but it just means we need more staff. But um, we recognize that our constituency is growing up and we are getting new diagnosed adults as well. We are very interested in creating services for adults, employment, social opportunities. We see the need and uh, you know this is not something you outgrow. But Tell you people with. how to reach you. Um, so our organization is CARD. If you look at our website, umcard.org, uh, call us, make an appointment, come in. Register with us. Uh, we have all of our events are free. All of our services are free, which is unheard of in the autism world, which is a very expensive world. Um, we have groups for uh, grandparents, siblings, parents, fathers, separate groups, uh, mothers, separate groups. We do many, many things, and all for free. Excuse me, what was that again? I called you card. We are, you many of us couldn't hear. That's CARD, C-A-R-D, the Center for Autism Related Disability. Yeah. I'm sorry. Wait, Let me just repeat this loudly because you couldn't hear. It's C-A-R-D at the University of Miami, Center for Autism Related Disability. 
someone out there has hearing like me, okay? And um, C-A-R-D at the University of Miami. And if you can talk to her later in the blue dress over here, because blue is Autism Awareness Month, you know, so we have to wear blue this month. How could you see if, if you were an adult? So, so our clinical director is here also, and we can come on up here. Come here on. Our clinical director. Hold on, then. Come up here for a minute. Me? You? No. Oh, Whoever wants to answer these questions that I am not an expert at. Maybe like Yilda and Elena are. Maybe they're experts. So happy to field some questions. So um, if you call us at CARD, each situation is different, so I'm not going to send you kind of on a wild goose chase of here's a test on the internet that you can use. Um, but if you call us, we will have a clinician walk you through your particular circumstances or whoever you're inquiring about, what tests and clinics and, and ways you can find out if an adult that you know is on the autism spectrum or does have Asperger's. So, you know. There, there are many different tests out there that you can use to diagnose, um, but we would want to send you someplace individualized for your circumstances. The only other comment I have is I've been involved with two beautiful young boys that are twins for 10 years, they're 12 now, and they, they both have this disorder. They're extremely intelligent, they're in all the gifted programs, but they're socially inept, and it's been very difficult for their parents who are divorced, but um, you said something that was so simple, and. It, it's just when you li when you speak to them, when you say listen, it's beyond listening. You have to erase your brain and fo focus exactly on what they're saying because they're extremely little. It took me a long time, and it was a silly thing. Like I was making them breakfast. You want peanut butter or butter? Or what do you want on your toast? And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my god! I mean, it just it was an epiphany. It's like extremely literal, but it it, it was so difficult to. It's hard to understand, and they're so frustrated, and they get frustrated, and the parents well, get frustrated, and it's just a mess. Right, so we want to avoid the mess. And someone who interned with us, uh, Jake, when he went to an autism uh, get-together at the FAU card up okay. there, um, somebody asked him and said, uh, what do you think of this Asperger's disorder? He said... I don't think it's a disorder. I think it's a misunderstanding. <laughs> that, and that's what I want to do. I want us to be interpreters. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, I'm, I have no clue, uh, Steve, as to what I'm supposed to be doing with time now. So if you want to, I know you have another speaker. Wind it up now? Okay. Yes, and that's another. That's another. It's, a, it's another discussion for another time. What I want to do with Asper tools is be effective. Okay, and right now in this forum, we got everybody deputized to recognize all the different brains. We're not going to be discussing all of them today. Yes, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to encourage all of us. If an idiot like me can learn some of these things, as you saw in the movie, okay, then we all have a, have a good chance. I mean, Dr. Lori Butts, who's the president of the Florida Psychological Association, who's here, over here, she told me, go talk to her afterwards. <laughs> Lori, wave your hand there. So Lori said to me when I sent her the first three chapters, she goes, Hacky, you're right, you are an idiot. And I go, I know, but why? And Laurie says, because you've written a book about relationships in general, about parenting in general, okay? It's not just about Asperger's. I said, I know, but this is the story how I learned it. And so in our documentary, which I think we're probably going to post the first one for free because there's a lot of great information from real experts like Dr. Laurie Butts, Dr. Mike Rizzo, uh, Abe Fischler, President Emeritus of Nova University, Dr. Brian Udell, the autism doctor, uh, Susie Mendelson, a lot of other people, the people from CAR down in Miami, up at FAU. Um, and I want to do it also by entertaining, by the 
the square root of two movies, which Mark Davis and Yoli Davis were nice enough to have their daughters appear in that, so we had some really good acting in it. And uh, we, we want to get everybody positive. This is a message to be positive. The people who really know stuff are the people from CARD. I'm a cheerleader. And I'm trying to give you just real tools you can really use in Aspera Tools. You use a checklist, will help. All right, a checklist will help. Positive routines will help. All these things will help. They're not a magic bullet, but they're good for all of our different brains. Now listen, I, uh, they have another speaker coming in. Please contact us at aspiratools.com. Please help spread the word. And uh, please... Uh, Go up to Amazon. If you leave here, Books and Books is the place to buy the thing right now. Yes. I'm getting, That's I'm what deaf they here. To say. Books and Books. Books and Books. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, if you're still watching online, you can give us a call. We'll get a book autograph for you. Dr. Ryder will be in the other side of the store signing. The books are for sale at the counter on both sides of the store. Thank you all so much for coming.